he was most embarrassed. Uh, there is a kept session record and you see somebody's pulled out all the names of the people that turned up to give evidence. That's people in a place at a time, you know, all about them and it will give their relationships. They're just wonderful. Um, and I'm going to show you a, another example of how the church gets its hands on things. This, this is Andrew Balfour, Colonel Andrew Balfour, who was important in, in the militia, round right about here, actually, in the, in the, in the Patriotic War. Uh, but he came from Edinburgh and his father was a merchant. And uh, the people here didn't actually know too much about his, his life before he came to the Carolinas. Um, so I found his baptism record. And this is his father, Andrew Balfour of Braidwood. And then it says, fornicating with Mary Robertson. <laughs> That's, that's the, the minister getting, you know, and, you know, four weeks later, they're back at the same church getting married. <laughs> Just to get it right. <laughs> um, the Catholic records, I won't dwell on them, but they exist mainly from the 1790s. A lot of the earlier ones were destroyed, actually, by the Catholic Church itself, because for quite a long time in Scotland, it was not a good idea to have your name on a list as being a Catholic. Yes, you know, that's where that goes. But after the Toleration Act, they're there. And they have lots of it. They have birth marriages, I'm oh, sorry, baptism marriages, burials. They have seat rentals. They also have confessions lists. No, don't get excited. It doesn't tell you what they confess to. They just list of people who've taken confessions. So they're in a state of grace. They can go to mass and so on. But a really lovely thing is this happened a lot. Some of the top one is a baptism record. The bottom one is the same girl getting married 20 odd years later. But the second priest has gone back to the baptism record and it annotated the fact of the marriage. I mean, how often do you not really know that it's the same person you're chasing? Not in this case. And right up to the 1950s, some of those are in Latin, until the Second Vatican Council. Um, I always issue a word of warning. Do not trust gravestones. They're very often not actually constructed until quite late after the events they record, sometimes a generation later. And I've seen examples of, of ages and dates on gravestones being changed in order to ensure that a couple are considered married when the children were born, or the, you know, just changing the dates slightly and all that stuff, or making someone an elder brother when in fact they're not. So don't trust them, always check the original sources. Um, there are many other things I could tell you about. Uh, wills and testaments, so just let me say that. These are two different things in Scotland. We don't have probate, by the way, in Scotland. It's called confirmation. And a testament, which is the document that is given to you, on death, which usually has an inventory and uh, appoint an executor and all that stuff, and you may or may not have a will clause inserted in there. Now the law in Scotland is that uh, of your movable possessions, of your cash, of your furniture, of your crops, one third has to go to the widow or widower, one third has to go to the children equally, still that law today, and one third can be disposed of at the will of the uh, person who's, who's dying or has died, um, if you don't leave a will clause, it's half and half. But the will clauses are sometimes fascinating because they tell you quite a lot about the family. They'll sometimes name children, they'll sometimes name grandchildren. They will often name someone and say, this person gets a shilling. That's not because he's being mean. It's because they just want to name that person as being a particular descendant or something. That's the origin of the phrase, cut off without a shilling, by the way. So that's what it's but I've got a cracker at home that says, nothing to my brother William, for he is a swine. <laughs> Poor old William, got nothing. And uh, in the list of, of possessions in the inventory, they're interesting too. Uh, one of the ones from our family says, one silk handkerchief used. <laughs> Could have washed it. So uh, do, not, do not look in wills, by the way, for land, houses, buildings. If you want to find out who, who got the farm, who got the castle, you've got to go to a wholly different set of records called Retoulers. Right up until 1868, you could not put real property, as it's called, into a will or a testament. Okay? So, so many people get the will out and then they're disappointed because they can't find where the house went or something. You do that a different way, never mind. And here's a good example of that. I found back in Scotland records, uh, testaments, wills actually, of the brother of that guy, Andrew Balfour, when he was implanted over here in the Carolinas. So there's an American life brought to life by documents that are back in Scotland. So it is worth looking to see if your ancestors left anything back there. Um, 
that's enough for Scotland's people. Like, that's a great place to go. But by the way, at the end of this, I have some handouts I can give you which have all these sources and URLs in them, okay? So that I'm not killed in the crush. We'll give these out outside. Uh, we first come for serve because we've only got so many. Yesterday was a bit busy. Right, Scotland's places. Sounds like it's all about geography. And of course it is, but it's also about people. Because this is where you get land records, tax records and so on. Now, just to give you some examples of the wonderful tax records they have. In about the 1790s, people were paying window tax, of course, but also clock and watch tax, a uh, dog tax, a carriage tax, a working horse tax, a farm horse tax, a male servant tax, a female servant tax, and then they paid a tax on all the taxes they paid called composition tax. And the Prime Minister at the time, William Pitt, thought this was incredibly stupid, and he wiped it all away, and he invented a thing called income tax. Okay? So you've got him to thank for that one. Yes? I will happily tell him when I go back how you feel about that. Um, but here's just one example, a female servant tax, and what's interesting about it is that uh, the, the upper, you can't read it, the upper entry is for a guy called McAllister of Luke, who's the chief of McAllister, who has these female servants. But, but below that, the second one down, is for a lady called McAllister who's a servant to somebody else. So we're not just getting the landed gentry in these records, we're getting everybody. And in fact, I was able to track the same family back another 18 years in a different set of records called the half tax, which you paid money on a fireplace, um, back to uh, back to the 16, 1690s, 1680s, back there. So a lot of records in Scotland's places too. And the other thing that they have on there, but you can also get them from the National Library of Scotland, is the most incredible set of, I think about 20,000 maps, and get this, all free to download, right? Free. And they go back as far as, well, the earliest ones, I like this one from the 1590s, a guy called Timothy Pont, who went all over Scotland and drew what he saw. He didn't just draw, you know, roads and mountains, he actually drew buildings. And sometimes he's the only record of a building that we have from that period. No photographs, right? But anyone who knows, this is Perth, anyone who knows Schoon Palace will recognise that as Schoon Palace. He was very accurate. And his, his maps were taken about 80 years later by a Dutch map maker called Johan Blau and made even better. And there are many more examples of maps, but I like John Wood's town plans. 1820s, they're just pre-census, and he not only drew up where the buildings are, he wrote against them the names of the people who lived there. You know? So you can tell that that period, Mr. McFarlane is up there in the manse, Mr. Wilson and Miss Valentine is proposing to boil something, you'll notice down there. Quails, actually. Um, so do get the maps, because they're a great way of finding out what a place was called back in the times you're looking at. Remember, the spelling may be very different now. Um, so, I've told you about uh, the places online you can get these things. There are some free sites as well, but I would encourage you also uh, to look at the National Archives of Scotland. It's now called the National Records of Scotland. That's where all the legal records are. And if you come to Edinburgh for a visit and to do your research, and we wish you would, come and see us. In fact, come and stay with us. My wife's in front row, she's just fainted. <laughs> and if you go to the Scotland's People Centre, that building there, opposite, you know, Balmoral Hotel on Princess Street, um, this, the, all that stuff I've been telling you about is downstairs. The, the legal records and, and other things are upstairs in the historical search room, and you'll love this bit. If a lawyer goes there to do research, they get charged for it. People like us, we get it free. You know? Yes, exactly. When did it ever happen that the lawyers have to pay and we get it for nothing? So that's a good one. But also, go to the National Library of Scotland, which is a tremendous amount of documents, including, for example, collections of letters sent home from immigrants. So you might find what your ancestors wrote to their auntie, and the letter has been collected back there. Do that. Um, the, uh, the Mormons have, have uh, LDS family research centres, about 23 or so around Scotland, <laughs> all, of course, networked back to, back to Utah. Um, what do we, and, of course, there are clan and family centres all over the place, too, which are worth checking. So, if you want to find out more about this, I would, here's a book I thoroughly recommend. <laughs> so, Scottish Genealogy by a certain person. Um, I'm afraid I can't sell you one because we're sold out, would you believe it? But they are on Amazon, right? All good booksellers and a few bad ones as well. 
including Amazon. You'll get them there. Um, there are a couple of other books you may be interested in too. Go look them up. Um, and finally, if you're really interested in this, the university that I'm associated with back home, University of Strathclyde. Have you heard of that? It's quite a new university. It's only been going since 1798. Right? It's quite modern in Scottish terms. Uh, but we, we set up, a few years ago, I set up a complete set of courses in genealogy all the way up to masters. Yeah? But you can do shorter eight-week online courses as well um, in genealogy, in heraldry, which I run at the moment, and DNA, genetic genealogy. They're worth taking if you want to do something online in the quietness of your own bedroom. That's the thing to do. And just go to the Strathclyde website and they'll, they'll tell you all about it. Um, I could talk about Case, but if you're interested in asking, finding out whether your chief can harvest anything, uh, four o'clock in the chief's tent this afternoon, and I'll explain it all to you. Um, I won't say anything about coats of arms other than simply this. Please remember this for the rest of your lives. There is no such thing as a family coat of arms. It's a legal and historical nonsensity. The arms, coat of arms, is the legal, heritable, personal property of one person at a time. And if you go around to Scotland waiting for a coat of arms to be given off the internet or something, you could go to prison, right? It's statute law, it's not custom and practice. Now, if you want a real coat of arms that's just yours, and you can prove your Scottish roots, you can petition the Lord Latin and get one. And I will happily help you. Lots of people have done that, and it's a fine thing. And it's heritable, so you can pass it on to your children. Unlike your car, which will be broken down by that time, okay? Uh, don't take someone else's arms, it's theft. Theft. Okay. Um, thank you for that. If you want to talk further, come and see us in the jury tent. And I would just remind you of one thing, which is that genealogy is the only thing we do where a step backwards is considered progress. Yeah? Thanks very much for joining us.